we're starting a, a new series. It's Christmas time. It's called Unwrapping Christmas. We're starting a new series, Unwrapping Christmas. And, you know, we talk about, churches talk about Christmas a lot at this time. A lot of people come to church during Christmas and Easter. And we talk about the birth of Christ. We talk about the wise guys, the wise men, the magi. We talk about the shepherds. We talk about the angels. We talk about no room at the end. And, you know, we, we make it a certain thing. But none of that matters if it's not true. None of that matters if it's not true. When we come to church, it's not just to make us feel good. I'm not always going to tell you what you want to hear. I don't want you to always tell me what I want to hear. And when we put the series together, Mac and I, we started writing it, and then we paused, and we're like, what are we doing? This cannot be man-made. And so we prayed. We said, Lord, what is it that you would like to do? What is it that you would like for us to learn and for us to remember? And we came up with unwrapping Christmas, what it's all about. And we're gonna go, f- these next four weeks, we're gonna unwrap certain parts about Christmas. And so each week, you're gonna wanna come back because we're unwrapping a lot. And this first one, this is a nail biter for me. And I do wanna give a shout out to one of my great friends and mentors, Gordon Rumble. He's out in Modesto, California at a church called Big Valley Grace. And him and I have studied the word of God together for a long time. And when it comes to prophecy, He has helped me learn how to study, how to go back, and how to use scripture and the text to get prophecy down. If you like prophecy, well, the Bible's got a lot of it. We're going to talk about some of that today. And next week, we have one of our elders, Dr. Mike. He's going to unpack the Messianic prophecy. And if you like that, you're going to want to come to that and make sure you bring your notebook every single week because we're unwrapping a lot. And then the week after that, we're going to talk about unwrapping the gifts of a king. We're going to talk about the wise men. Who were these guys? What did they bring and why? the significance to them, how they even got there. We're going to go all the way to the book of Daniel for that one as well. And then the last one, we're going to talk about the greatest gift of all time, Jesus Christ. I do believe that we're getting at a time to where standing up for the truth is going to be lonely. Standing on God's word is going to be tough. What is it that we believe and why? In your Bibles, in 1 Peter 3, verse 15, it tells us this. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks about the hope you, or about your hope as a believer, sometimes, oh, no, it doesn't say that, sorry. Every now and then, no. Only during Christmas and Easter, no, no. Always, everyone say always. always. Always be ready to explain it. Lord, we just ask for you to work in this place this morning. Work in and through your word. Remove any distractions that we have so that we could come to know you, so we can understand you, understand what you've come to do. May we not just leave it here, but let this impact and transform our lives to where we go out and share the gospel. We go out and communicate in such a way that you are clearly moving in our lives. And may we be excited that you have written our names in the book of life, that if, how we're seeing the evidence of you working in our lives, Lord. I ask for the other churches that are meeting right now. There are other great godly men that are teaching, that are unpacking your word all up and down this valley. So I want to lift them up to you, that you protect them, that you anoint them, that you let your spirit work through their lives as they're communicating and handling your word. May people come to know your son, Jesus Christ, not just at Hope City, but all over the world as those are meeting and gathering right now. So Lord, lift up the other churches in this area and may people come to know you. Give us wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you to, in that verse, 1 Peter 3.15, I talk. I talk for a living. I communicate God's word to people. I was not always like that. I hated the Bible. I hated Christians. I hated when Christians would give me their Bible and tell me how I was living was wrong. I did not like it when a Christian would ask me, did you go to church today, Matt? 
And I'd make up some excuse where I'd give them a, a Christian answer. No, I was, I was tired, but I'm going to make it next week. I would give them some type of feel-good moment to get them off my back. I was tired of feeling those ways, but God transformed my life. He got a hold of my life at 21 years old, and there's no turning back ever since. That same God that rescued me with a hard heart, a hard mind towards believers is the same God that's sitting on the throne right now transforming lives. He is real, he's on the move, he's not sleeping, he's moving, and he uses this word right here to transform our lives. Now, me, there, there's labels that, some, that, that we give ourselves sometimes. Believe it or not, when I say this, you probably won't believe it. You might chuckle, you may laugh, but I, by how I design, am an introvert. I love being by myself sometimes. I like to just sit and relax, and that's kind of like a phone. Like That's how I get charged up and I'm ready to go. But what God's done in my life, he's wired me and programmed me to have to be extroverted now to communicate God's word, and that is hard for me to do sometimes. Uh, I have a, a life group that I meet with, and sometimes I just like to sit and listen, and they are ministering to me. And God is good in how he does that. And it's nice. And if you ever see me sitting and you're like, is he okay? Yep, I'm just getting charged up. But what this verse is telling us is to always be ready to share the gospel, to share the hope that we have. And as I've talked, I talk to different uh, denominations, different types of beliefs. I've gone around to different states to preach. I have gone to different churches in this area to preach. I have talked to all sorts of people from all different backgrounds. And when I talk to believers, I find that the answer I get for why is it you believe what you believe, a hard answer to, to get from people. Sometimes it's just, I feel it. Just because I know. For some of the youth, it's because my mom and dad. We're not at a place where we could just go off of our feelings. If I were to go off my feelings, I probably wouldn't be on the stage right now. I'd be sleeping in. I can't trust my feelings. Sometimes I like Taco Bell, sometimes I don't. I'm wishy-washy. I can't trust my feelings. I need to trust in the one who never changes. And I need to be ready to give an account for the hope that I have. And you do too. I don't want Christians to take a back seat to this world and us just saying, oh, I don't know. I don't know. I feel like we have just adapted to the world and we've been okay with some things. I feel like we've been silent. I feel like it's been hard to stand up and be bold. It's almost like if you stand up and say something, you're now the enemy. Isn't it funny that we've actually seen this in scripture with David and Goliath? You have this little teenage mutant ninja shepherd that steps out into a field and he's the only one who is offended. All these soldiers know the living God. They know the stories of what he has delivered them from. And when they come to face the world and someone making fun of God's word, they all flee and they're afraid and they forgot to stand on the one who has delivered them. And we could sometimes do the same thing. David's the only one that steps in and says, is anyone else offended at this? Why is no one else taking a stand for God? This little boy. Now he goes and he talks to the king and he's offended. And I don't want to lose that offense as God has transformed my life. You know what? I was, uh, Dan Brahms, he's not here. He's one of our leaders. He did this message on this and he made a great point. He talks about how you see God working in your life and me and him have both gone back to listen to some of the old music we listened to or the comedians we used to listen to. We listen to these things and you know what? I listen to it. I'm offended. I cannot believe some of the stuff I was listening to. I was like, whew. But instead of being embarrassed, I'm like, thank you, Lord, for transforming my mind and my life to see that this is worldly and I don't need this, I need you. And so as we look at some of our passages, we're gonna be going through the Bible a lot today. I did this last week, we had a Bible workout, we're gonna do it this one as well. But there are a lot of different beliefs out there, a lot of different religions out there. What is true? What makes Christianity any different? If you're young in the faith, well, hopefully this helps you. If you've been walking with the Lord for a while, well, hopefully this helps you. But you're not getting to heaven because your mom, dad, aunt, uncle, grandma, grandpa 
are, <laughs> we are standing before the Lord. My wife will not stand there next to me as I'm making account before the Lord. I will be standing there and I will have to give an account by one of the greatest questions ever asked that's been documented and it's, what shall I do with Jesus? But to be ready to give an answer. If we look at the surprise in Surprise Arizona Analytics. I, is anyone else an analytics person? I love analytics. I like numbers. I got a calculator watch. 39% are religious. When I talk to some of the youth, all my friends are Christians. I don't know anyone that's not a Christian. John 3.16. You know, they get so scared to say that they have friends that aren't believers. I got friends that aren't believers. But 39% in Surprise are religious. There's 12 different religions. There's a little over 12 that are in Surprise, Arizona, but all over the world, there's 4,000 religions. There's over 4,000 religions in the world. Who or what is right? Would you be willing to take a stand for what you believe in and to say how you know that it's true? There can't all be these different truths. You hear, live your truth, do your truth, live, and that's why we have the world where it's at today. Everyone can just do whatever they want. But we've been called to take a stand and live by the truth. This is the word of God. And so who or what is true? I did a, a social media post, and I asked this question. I said, hey, how do you guys know the Bible's true? And here's some of the responses that we got on there. Here's some of them. Here's some of them. The word is alive, and Jesus went through everything we feel in our daily lives. It is reliable based off of the historical evidences. Because of the complexity of the world around me as well as the light of God in the life and people around me. Personally witnessing the Holy Spirit work in my life and the lives of those around me. The fact that the word of God convicts believers and non-believers alike no matter how old, old it is. All the historically documented ful fulfilled prophecies. Man, we got a lot of godly people in our congregation. You guys are great. But not just that. Here's uh, what some other people said. How do you know that the Bible is correct and accurate? Why do you follow teachings from a book? This man is talking about me, is, is coping so hard. Life is pointless. We give it meaning by doing good while we are here for people to remember us. But does it include dinosaurs? No, bad book. I like this one. It's pointless, bro. Source, trust me, bro. My kids say that word now, bro. Not one contradiction. I haven't read it, but if he loves everyone, why is he hating look down on gay couples? Come out of your Christian insanity. We have one life to live, so live it now. Stop waiting on the last judgment. It will never come. If you were to go to the White House, the president invites you to the White House, and he flies a 747 over here to surprise Arizona to pick you up, and you go over and fly over to the White House, and you're going to stand before millions of people to give a reason why you believe in what you believe. As believers, we should know for a fact that Christianity is true, that Christ is real, and that we should not doubt or waver from that. Would you be willing to stand before millions of people and say why it is what you believe is what you believe and that it is true? And so if you were to stand at the podium looking straight at the camera, you might want to start off by saying something like this. Mr. President, men and women of the world, I believe that Christianity is true. I know it to be true because of this right here. This is what separates us from all other religions and from everything else. This is the word of God written by Jesus to us to redeem mankind. It is supernatural, alive, and active. No other book can do that but this one. And we're going to look into these next 20 minutes of how do we know the Bible is true. We're going to look at prophecy. We're going to look at the historical accuracies and evidences. And I'll tell you, here's what not to say if you were on that stage addressing the world. Here's what you don't say. I know I'm right because I feel I'm right. I already talked about it. You can't talk about your feelings my feelings go back and forth. Imagine where my marriage would be if I went by my feelings. Imagine where my kids would be if I went through my feelings. Imagine where my car would be if I went through my feelings, sitting in that traffic and red lights. And whew. I know I'm right because there are more Christians than all the other religions. 
That used to be true a long time ago. Probably right now there's about 2 billion Christians, and Islam is 1.8 billion. I'm sorry, billion. So Christianity is actually slightly going down over these last couple years. The percentage of Christians is slightly going down. Other religions are kind of going up. But here's another one that you don't want to say. I'm right because people that look like me and worship like me are more dedicated and much happier. We don't want to say that either. These are what you don't say. These are what you don't say. Because all the other ones could say that too. But I want you to do is in your Bibles go to John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. It's one of the four Gospels. If, again, if you are new to the faith or you've been doing your quiet times in the morning, you want to know and be reminded of who Jesus is, the four Gospels is an amazing place to read, to know who Jesus is, to learn about the one who came and set us free. But John chapter 20, it's towards the end of the book, verses 30 and 31. John chapter 20, verses 30 through 31. It's going to tell us about the purpose of this book. The purpose of the Bible is written for us right here. Here's the point of this Bible. Here's why this Bible is important. That's why when we say, hey, if you need a Bible, raise your hand. Do not just take my word for it because I'm sitting up here. If Dr. Mike were here, he's one of our else. He goes by the Berean Challenge. It's where they would look through the scriptures to see if what the person was saying is accurate and line up with scripture. Bring your Bibles. Let it impact your life. Verse 30. The disciples saw Jesus do many other miraculous signs in addition to the ones recorded in this book. Verse 31. But these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. This is written so we can continue to believe in Jesus. You do not have to to doubt if he exists. You don't have to doubt if he is there. He is there. Now, you can feel those things at times. That's why I can't trust my feelings. I've gone through situations in my life too, and I wonder, God, why? Which is why I need to go back to this. Here's seven or six things we're going to look at when it comes to the Bible. It is perfect in its unity. The Bible is perfect in its unity. We're going to look at it's perfect and even how it's indestructible. It's indestructibility, it's historical accuracy, it's prophetic accuracy, scientific accuracy. And then the last one, it's transforming power to change a life. The Bible is perfect in its unity, its indestructibility historical accuracy, prophetic accuracy, scientific accuracy, and transforming power to save a life. Let's just look at the unity of the Bible real quick. There are 1,189 chapters, 66 books, over 700,000 words, written in three different languages in the span of over 1,500 years, yet it is perfect. 1,189 chapters, 66 books, but all have to be written by one person, right? No, written by over 40 different authors. And they all had different occupations. They were kings, fishermen, tax collectors, shepherds. All different types of backgrounds. There were 15 different occupations, different locations, different styles of writing, hymns, history, letters, laws, proverbs, teachings, and doctrine, yet it's still perfect in its unity. Even with all of that, if you were to have all of us right now just write a letter, if I say, hey, I need you to write, write a letter of what happened today at church, and we're going to all put it together, this would be a big mess of a book, wouldn't it? We'd all have a lot of different styles of writing. And some things might not all line up, but yet you're talking about 66 books, 1,189 chapters, yet all of it is perfect and lines up. Different backgrounds, different styles of writing, and yet it's one continuous story of unity. It tells a complete story of these things. Creation, corruption, condemnation, justification, sanctification, salvation, forgiveness. All the way from the beginning of Genesis through the end of Revelation, it tells one story. 
God's redemptive love to mankind through Jesus Christ. This book right here is not written about me. And that's where we mess up and want to feel good sometimes. Is I want to say this is about me. Thank you, I feel good. It's written to me through inspiration of the Holy Spirit, through authors, so that I know that the way I've been living was wrong and I need to repent and turn the other way and go back to the one who created me. I'm not my own God. I cannot do whatever I want. There's one God who sits on the throne and this whole book could tell me all about him. Over in 2 Peter, it's to the right. We started off in 1 Peter. We're gonna look at 2 Peter chapter one. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. None of this was done by this human inspiration, but it says, For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is who directed the pen of these authors. I get a lot. How can you trust a book that's written by man? Yet we all go to school. We read our history books, our textbooks, our science books. It's all written by man, and we have no problem trusting those. But when it comes to the Bible, how could you trust that? It's written by man. It's written through the Holy Spirit, through the pen of these men, and it brought it back to their mind, some of the things that they witnessed, some of the things that they saw. And so this is reliable and trustworthy. The first one we're going to look at is the indestructibility of the gospel. Isaiah 40, verse 8. I'm going to go through a lot of verses, but you guys can write these down if you want to check them later. Isaiah 40, verse 8 says, The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Forever. It is indestructible. There have been different kings and emperors that have tried to come out and take out the word of God. It has not happened. One of the next guys to take over after Constantine thought for sure Christianity would be wiped out. He tried to make Christians extinct. Thought he got rid of all the Bibles. Within 24 hours, there were 500 more. It's indestructible. This is something that's been prophesied as well. It will stand forever. Everything will go away, but the word of God... Matthew 24, 35, Jesus' own word says, heaven and earth will disappear, but my words will never disappear. We put our hope in so many things in this world, don't we? We put our hope in our jobs. We could put our hope in our finances, our hope in our families. And I hate to break it to all of us, including myself, all of those will go away. None of those can fulfill me. Each of those things I just mentioned will let us down. Don't believe me? A couple years ago, there was something called 2020. Shut down everything. Jobs were taken out. People were taken out. Finances were in question. One thing survived. The indestructibility of the gospel. I saw church more than ever during 2020. I needed that. Because I was putting my hope in sports and videos and movies and people and thinking, people need me. And then everything got shut down. I realized I needed the Lord. I needed to draw to his word because I was getting away from it. And it sparked this renewal in me to read this differently, to draw closer to him. Because everything will fade away but him. Why would I not, in that point right there, why would I not just want to run to this? The only thing that survived everything. It is indestructible. Never once been taken out, and it never will. Our God, our Savior, is the beginning and the end, the Alpha, the Omega, the first, the last, and still to come. He will not go anywhere. Nothing can take him out. And I want to stand firm on his word because it's indestructible. I want to be like the wise man who built his house on a solid foundation. If I build my house, my family, my marriage, if I build that on the world... I'm going down. What else do I have? But if I build it on this, I may lose things. I will go through trials. I will go through hard times, but I will be standing firm because he's got me. That'll never change. And obviously, as we go through all these, there's way more than the things I'm going to share. 
There's a lot more other ways of its indestructibility, but we're gonna, because of time, we're gonna look at the historical accuracy of the Bible. This is some people's favorite. We're gonna throw some of these on here. It's finally agreed that the beginning of civilization did begin in the Tigris and Euphrates regions of the world. There's a lot of the times they didn't think that. Man has finally admitted that there was a massive flood worldwide in every culture as its flood traditions. Man has finally admitted that the walls of Jericho did fall outward and downward and completely flat. You can write these verses down. If you don't believe me, you can go back and look at all the history stuff, and it's all confirming all these. What I love is there's so many things that people have been trying to get about the Bible, and every time archaeology happens, every time history happens, it proves the Bible more and more true. Isn't that phenomenal? I love it. Man has finally admitted because it has now been dug up that there's a real house of solid ivory that King Ahab, Ahab built. That was uh, my mentor, Gordon Rumble. That was one of his favorites. He talked about that one all the time. And we look up the articles on how the, the house of ivory was, was, was discovered. There's many, many more, like crucifixion. There was a lot of times they didn't believe crucifixion was real. That wasn't the way that they executed people. But yet, they dug up someone who had a spike in his heels, whose hands looked like they'd been outstretched on a cross, and they did prove that Christian or that that uh, crucifixion was a way of execution. Shocker, that the Bible could say things and that it's true. More and more and more. There was a time also where they didn't believe King David was a real person, and even recent discoveries have shown that his his family was real. It's still being unpacked, and it still will. There's a lot of historical evidence. Now we're gonna look at the, some of the prophetic accuracy. And for this prophetic accuracy, I don't wanna go too deep into it because I don't wanna steal what Dr. Mike's gonna share next week. But he's gonna just strictly talk about the messianic prophecy. I want you to know one third of the Bible that you're holding in your hands right now is prophetic. One third of your Bible is prophetic. Half of it has already been fulfilled. Because God is faithful in fulfilling these prophecies, we can be assured he will fulfill the rest. Here's what we know about God right here. This is, for me, what I love. Numbers 23, 19 tells us God is not a man, so he does not lie. He is not human, so he does not change his mind. Has he ever spoken and failed to act? Has he ever promised and not carried it through? The answer is no. Everything that he has said will happen has happened and will happen, and it's happening right now. We're seeing it. We are right now living in this time where we've been able to see things that people have been waiting to see their entire lives. But there's things that have been written hundreds and some thousands of years in advance that we're being getting to see. But if you like prophecy, this is one of the things that separates this book from every other book. Who would dare to write something and make a guess and for it to come true? It takes a lot of guts to do that. It takes a lot of guts to do that, but yet the Holy Spirit God, Jesus, are perfect, and they know everything. Israel becomes a nation on May 18th, 1948. You see this in Ezekiel 37. It says, therefore, prophesy to them and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Oh, my people, I will open your graves of exile and cause you to rise again. Then I will bring you back to the land of Israel. This was unheard of. They did not think that they would have be a nation again. And then in Isaiah 66, 8, it says, Who has ever seen anything as strange as this? Who has ever heard of such a thing? Has a nation ever been born in a single day? Yes. May 18th, 1948, Israel becomes a nation overnight. This is prophesied thousands of years ago. We get to be a part of this. We get to be a part of seeing God's word come true and we get to see a part of him drawing nearer and nearer and nearer. Here's, I'm gonna uh, list a couple that are exciting that have been fulfilled because like I said, Dr. Mike's gonna talk about this next week and I don't wanna go through all of it and I don't wanna get too deep into it, but fulfilled prophecy, the first coming of Christ. He came. This is talked about in a lot of, of passages, but there's Deuteronomy and Micah. And Jesus, the Savior of mankind. What we talked about last week, if you missed last week, so you go back and watch it. We talked about last week, the promise of Jesus, of Jesus coming, that there was going to be someone that was going to come and save us. It was always God's plan to redeem mankind. 
You see this in Genesis 3.15 and the whole chapter of Isaiah 53, you can see there's also Psalm 22, which is a good one. There's all these scriptures that have been fulfilled of the coming of Christ. He has came, he has died, he has rose again. And yet here's some fun ones that I look forward to that are still to be fulfilled. Rapture of the church. You see this in 1 Thessalonians 4. That was the first message I did here at Hope City. The tribulation and the second coming. The rapture of the church. Christ tells us he's coming back and he is coming back. We did see, has he ever said something that, that, that hasn't happened? He, everything he says is going to come true. That includes coming back for his church. He's going to come back for us when he's ready. In fact, when I said that they, they're perfect, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, you know, Jesus, when he gave up his divine nature, you know, he doesn't know he's coming back. He's going to look to the Father. The Father's going to say, go get him. That could be any time now. That's what I believe, and I'm standing on that. This is what brings me hope as a believer, that this could happen right now, and we will see the king of all kings. We will see the Lord of all lords, the Alpha, the Omega, the one who created all of it. We will be able to see him face to face. And we will be able to stand in his presence I wonder what that's going to be like to stand before the creator, to stand before the one who has known everything I've gone through, to be fully known and fully loved, for him to embrace me like I've never been held before. And some of you in here probably are dying for that, for someone to hold you and he's never going to let you go just like he never has and he never will. For him to say, well done my good and faithful servant. God, I was crying when this happened. The Bible even tells us he collects our tears. He writes them down and records them in his book. He's gonna say, I was right there. Matt, I sent you Gordon into your life. Yeah, but what about when I was lonely? I sent you your wife into your life. What about when I needed to know you more? I've sent you your life group. I've sent you your neighbors. I've sent you your youth. I've sent you your young adults. I've sent you your leaders. I've sent you the pastors. I've sent you the pastors in this valley that have checked in with you. Not only that, I sent my son for you. He's collected those tears. He's still sitting on the throne and he still reigns and he's coming back. Oh, Lord, come back soon. We can look up for our hope. Scientific accuracy of the Bible. These ones are pretty fun. We live in a, in, a, in, a, in a world, well, that's not true. We live in a nation that is heavily science. I have, I don't know if I can share this person or not, but I, I have a missionary that I'm really close with, and they were telling me that they're actually sending more missionaries to America. We don't need that. Isn't that the, that answer right there shows that we do. <laughs> I don't need that. And this person was telling me that overseas, it's actually easier to share the gospel because they already believe in the supernatural. They see demon possessions. They've seen healings. They've seen these. But they said in America, we got to see it to believe it. So it's harder because everything's got to be science and it's harder to reach to that heart. But science actually proves a lot of Christianity, which is so cool. When it talks about astronomy, the universe had a beginning. There's a lot of times that they didn't think it did. For a very long time, it had a beginning. These are my favorite 10 words. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And we're going to do a cool series in January. I'll unpack this more in that one. But right in those three, or in that, in those 10 words, you got all three things. You have uh, time, space, and matter. And all three. The universe had a beginning. And so you either believe that we just developed or evolved from animals. You believe that there was a big bang that happened. Or you believe that God created I'll tell you this, it takes more faith to believe everything else than to say God created. One human race, anthropology. 
we've been thought of to have developed and evolve or to shift from some things and Acts 17 26 tells us and he and he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth it's one race the human race it's one this was talked about in Acts and yet us smart people can't get that right we could think that we came from something yes we came from a creator if I were to tell you that this building was not here on Reams and Greenway, and overnight I hit two hammers together or something, and here it is, you probably would not come to this building. You would say, that guy. There was a big bang. It was God's voice saying, let there be light. He created we're not an accident. You were intelligently designed. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. There are no mistakes about you. The creator, he calls us a masterpiece. That's pretty cool. It's hard to believe that sometimes, isn't it? Did you know one human cell, one human cell is more complex than the cell phone? There is an intelligent designer behind everything except God because he is outside of time. We see this in the beginning. But there's one race, the human race. How about this one? The earth is round. This was talked about in Isaiah. It's also in Psalm. God sits above the circle of the earth. In some translations, the sphere. It's been round. There's still debates about that. And then there was a time when people thought that you can count all the stars. Scientific accuracy in Genesis 15, and there's other spots in the Bible that talks about how God has opened up the heavens to where it's trying to count all the sands of the shore, trying to count the stars. They used to think you could count them. One, two. <laughs> then they invented a telescope, and then they realized, oh, okay, there's more. Then another one. Oh, wait, there's more. Then no okay. The stars are innumerable. You cannot count them. And there's way, way, way more scientific accuracy. We've got time, space, matter, solid, liquid, gas, height, depth, width, uh, past, present, future. And that, those are things I could talk about in January. And everything points back to one. It's three and one in almost everything. But the one that I want to end with and, and, and leave you with is this one, the transforming power of the Bible. I cannot get that from any other book, what this book has done and what it is doing and how I can read it and it still transform my life. How I can read the story of David and Goliath a million times and yet still find something new. How I can read something and still say, oh my goodness, I can't get that anywhere else. Psalm 19.7, the instructions of the Lord are perfect reviving the soul. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Nothing else can do that. But this is what we stand on. This is true. This is Historically accurate, perfect in unity, perfect in its scientific accuracy, in its prophetic accuracy, in its transforming way to change a life. I will tell you that because I am standing here because of what this has done in my life. There is nothing that we have gone through that this will not provide us the answers for. There are times we go through things and we're like, why is this happening? What do I do with this? It's in here. Yeah, but Matt, then I actually have to read it. Uh-oh. Then I actually have to, well, like, let that be a part of my routine in the mornings. I usually wake up, I brush my teeth, I shower. I have to actually, like, ah, uh, it's okay. Yes. For all those six reasons and more above, we should be pouring into this. If I do not let this fill my mind and my heart, I will be easily convinced about what's out there. Yeah. Look at our youth. Easily convinced. 
I sit with them, I talk with them. My heart breaks when we don't apply this to our life. When I'm not standing on this, I'm a goner. I will believe almost anything that's out there because it's okay. Sounds good. I can't do that. I need to rely on this. You know what's tough about this? It tells me I'm a sinner. I told you, I'm not always going to tell you what you want to hear, what I want to hear. It tells me how I should treat my wife, how I should raise my kids, how I should live my life every day. It tells me that I'm a sinner and that I'm broken, and that I need a savior. And that alone will make people not want to read this, not want to walk in through these doors. That's what the church is for, for a place of people that know that they're broken and know they need a savior. And I have no problem saying it starts with this guy right here. I don't have all the answers. I don't know it all. But I can tell you what this has done in my life. I could tell you that God is good. I could tell you that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for my life and for your life so that we don't have to spend an eternity without him. He does not send people to hell. We go there because we're stubborn, because we don't want to believe this. We don't want to stand on this. We don't want to trust this. We don't want to read this. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, here on a rescue mission to save us from hell, a place they designed for the devil and his demons so he could restore that relationship with us by believing in his son, turning away from our past life and going towards him, letting this shape our lives, sanctify our lives, make our minds new because we've been tainted by the sinful world. This is what I want to believe and know that Christianity is true that the Bible is true, that every other religion tells me I have to do something to reach an unreachable God, but yet God came down in the flesh to reach us. Not even getting into Satan hates it. Christianity could be made fun of at any time. You can mock whatever you want on TV. Try doing that with any other religion. Why can't you? Because Satan hates this. He's the prince of this world right now. God allows things to happen. He's sitting on the throne. God is good, but he hates this. You know what else I've seen? Casting out demons. What other power can do that? What other religion does that? And I'm talking about religion. This is a relationship. This has power to transform lives and to deliver your life, to deliver you from the binds of chains of doubt and sin and shame and guilt and hell that Jesus can break, that no good works I could do could break it except by the power, the blood, and the name of Jesus Christ. God is good and all the time. (laughs) And if you want to receive this gift of Jesus Christ, if you want that transforming power of letting this renew your mind, you can do that today. When Jesus called people to him, he didn't say, get your act together and then follow me. Give up this addiction, then come follow me. He says, he he just wants a relationship with you. Just stand up and follow me. And that could be you this morning. You can make your way to him right now because he's made his way down here to us. He died for our sins, died for my sins, My past, present, future sins, I've been forgiven by the name and the blood and the power of Jesus Christ. I don't have to turn back. I don't have to look back, but I can look forward and look up with the hope of a future king that is coming, knowing that there is a place waiting for me of no more. And you have that same promise when you say yes to him. Nowhere in the Bible does it tell you tomorrow is a day of salvation. It says today. If you would like this gift, it's a free gift without any works. It's a free gift called grace through his son, Jesus Christ. You can say yes today and you can let him work and shift and change your life and transform your life all the days of your life. And it starts by filling your mind and your heart with this. Turning away from your old life and letting this book right here, which is living and active and breathing, which is sharper than any sword. Be a part of your life. Fill up your life. Renew your life. And I'm going to pray, and if you want Jesus as your Savior, if you want this, even if you want to come back to him, you've been off like a prodigal son like I've been, 
the greatest decision that young man made was in the pig pen, and he said, I'm going to arise and go to my father's house. You have that same invitation to come to the father, and he's going to run to you with arms wide open. I can't tell you how many times I've been afraid to say yes to Jesus because I thought if I came up to the front, I would get a spanking. That he would say, I told you, I told, no. He's ready to embrace you and welcome you home, welcome you back. So Lord, I ask that there's anyone in here that needs to know you, anyone in here that needs to run back to you, that they just say, I need you, Jesus, and may they run to the Father's arms. And if there's anyone in here that uh, needs to know that you're real, may they know it through not just what I'm saying, but by your word and by what you're going to do in their lives. If you want Jesus in your life, all you got to do is just say, dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. Please come into my life. Make my heart white as snow. I want to live for you all the days of my life. Forgive me. In Jesus' name, amen.